The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, guiding you through Mussorgsky's piano score and Ravel's orchestration of Pictures at an Exhibition. We left off with Il Vecchio Castello, which was quite a somber, slow, soft movement. Now Mussorgsky, having viewed that painting, is going to turn around and look at the great exhibition around him, the people thronged, the murmured conversations, and he's going to react with grandeur. At least that's how I see this particular promenade, which will introduce the next movement. It's quite stompy, and actually if you look at the tempo marking, moderato non tanto pesamente, that is to say not too moderately, in other words, on the faster side, right? So don't moderate yourself too much and weighing heavily, right? So it's going to be very stompy and a little bit brisker. So we assume that Mussorgsky is going to have to shoulder his way through the crowds at this point or through the throngs of people around the paintings. Actually, I don't know if there were throngs at the exhibition for the three days that Hartman's paintings were displayed, but let's just say that there were. The melody starts off again in B major this time. Remember that it started off in B flat for the first promenade, then A flat for the second promenade, and now we're going to maintain the key of five sharps for a little while. So statement in octaves, very solidly with a little bit of octave bass, then the octave bass turns just very naturally into the theme again, bum 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 bum, and so on, and it just states exactly what the right hand stated, two octaves lower, and this little chordal accompaniment from above is pretty much the same as we saw before in the previous promenade that introduced Il Vecchio. Now, the melody continues on, and here is a place where pianists have a tendency to move this ritardando and diminuendo a little bit forward, and they start to calm down a little bit here. That's just a traditional thing I've heard with a lot of pianists. And we've got the little syncopated descending notes. Interestingly here, this is repeated between both hands, softer, and then just the last three notes are repeated very, very softly. But be that as it may, as solid and as pianistic as it might seem, it's a very fun and pretty easy challenge for Ravel to orchestrate. It's the Mussorgsky orchestration challenge for Ravel. Can you orchestrate these eight bars in an interesting way? Let's find that out. So we'll listen to these very simple, very straightforward, direct eight bars on piano. Then I'll meet you on the other side for a little bit of analysis of Ravel's approach. <laughs> That was short and sweet. Now let's take a look at Ravel's very charming, very capable interpretation of those eight bars. Starting with a look at the orchestra, it's pretty straightforward. Two flutes, three oboes, two clarinets and bass clarinet, two bassoons and contrabassoon, 
two horns in F, and notice that Ravel indicates the first horn and the third horn. First trumpet in C, and third trombone in tuba, then just one harp, just playing a few notes at the end, and then of course strings. So let's dive into the analysis. First trumpet is coming back, only a half step away from where it originally played the opening theme. Remember, B flat major, right? And the first note of that melody in the opening promenade was a G natural in B flat major. Now it's a G sharp in B major. Everything's come up a half step. Notice something as well. Notice one other thing, and that is that the C trumpet is given no key signature, just like the F horns. And sometimes that's what I do in my scores. Sometimes I leave in a key signature, sometimes I don't. It's just pretty much whatever feels right to do, I have to say, in terms of the trumpets. Sometimes it's nice to have a key signature in there if the key signature is of specific use to all the heavy brass. Otherwise, I tend to leave it out. So, opening statement as a single line by the trumpet instead of octaves, right? And then we've got very, very stompy strings playing in octaves. Same thing here. We've got the contra bassoon taking the lower octave and the second bassoon diving down to grab the lower note wherever it can. Here, the two combine together as the contra bassoon dives even lower. And the bass clarinet pretty much just doubles the first bassoon. So it's a very thick, solid sound. Nevertheless, the string tone is going to come through very darkly, but it'll still put across that sense of kind of blundering triumph and pride. I feel that this emotion that is being expressed here by Mussorgsky is pride in his friend, his friend's achievement, and the fact that he really was a full-fledged artist, not just somebody who wanted to be an artist, and that was really proven at that exhibition even though Hartman was not really having success as a recognized artist in Russia. One of the hardest things to do, I imagine, at that time. Probably just as hard as trying to be a recognized composer there, like Mussorgsky. Now, as this opening phrase comes to an end, we have the trombones and tuba take over. Bum, 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 bum. Along to pizzicato in the lower strings, and a little bit of contra bassoon and second bassoon, doubling those low pitches. And that pretty much comprises the melody. Contra bassoon, second bassoon, and trombone and tuba with pizzicato. And so everything else that you see in these two bars is the chordal accompaniment that just reaches higher and higher. And you know, voiced pretty simply, the oboes on top, jumping up to flutes as things get a little bit higher, and third oboe, clarinets, first bassoon, horn, and so on. These are all essentially doubling what's going on here in the strings. Very simple intervals in divisi, opening out to divisi in three. So the harmony really soars as you get toward the end here. Then, do you recall that there was that place where the melody comes back to the right hand? And I told you that some pianists tend to move the ritardando and diminuendo a little bit forwards so that they're slowing down and they're kind of preparing the listener psychologically for what's happening in these last two bars. Well, Ravel doesn't do that. He just stays in forte here and keeps the octave melody really simple. All of the upper winds and clarinets are playing exactly the same notes, and that is a scorching sound. It's a wonderful sound, and that's a really great place to listen to that particular approach and see whether or not that's something you ever want to do in your scoring. And then, of course, that entire massive unison is balanced by a single trumpet playing an octave below it, which I think is hilarious. And then the little syncopated bass walking down step by step is played by bass clarinet, bassoons, and the lower strings. And very simply too, just 
double basses taking the bottom part of the octave, violas taking the top part of the octave, played in cellos, and pretty much the same thing here, bassoons playing that octave, and the bass clarinet doubling the bottom line. Now this is really beautiful right here. A2 bassoons, right? And they are going to be playing this single line here. Rebel has elected not to interpret this as the octaves that are stated in the piano part, but just as a single unison line with all the strings diminuendoing. And then there's a little echo here at the end. Now this echo is what I feel is just the height of craft by Ravel, because what is he doing here? He is emulating the sound of a piano in an extremely clever way. Pizzicato, violas, and cellos on the same tones. Horns, mezzo forte, tailing off, also on those same tones. Remember, you have to read down a fifth. And a single harp playing forte in a very cool way. If you've been paying attention, you'll notice that the harp is in seven flats as opposed to five sharps and harmonically the same key signature, just for these three notes, right? But what that means is that Ravel wants the longest string length possible for those pitches. Sharps have more string tension and flats have the least tension, so it has the most generous sound on harp. So that's a little bit of craft thrown in there, but what's really crafty here is that Ravel is achieving a unison on harp by having harmonics in the left hand that sound an octave higher. So this note is essentially doubled. So you get that sense of doubled strings, very similar to a piano, right? Plus the pizzicato, which should be balanced. Conductors may take some time here to balance this out and really make sure this effect comes off great. So we've got the pizzicato as well, adding yet another string or strings. So what has tripled strings? That is a piano, right? So we have the sound of the tripled strings, at least the attack, and part of the resonance in the harp. And then to complete the illusion of the resonance, we've got doubled horns playing in a place where they can control the dynamics if they need to. Right? So that is very fun, and you will hear when we play back the music now to this screen that exact effect of attempting to sound like a piano with the orchestra, perhaps sounding even better than the piano would sound with the orchestra. So listen for all of those things. The role of the trumpet in both just announcing this without the octaves over very, very stompy lower winds and strings. Then the combination of pizzicato, lowest brass, and a little bit of bassoon and contrabassoon as the answering melody from below. And this very simple division of all of the string parts above as they're doubled by the winds, getting thicker and thicker. Then this massive unison by all of the upper winds and clarinets doubled from below by the trumpet, just to see what the balance is like there, right? Pay attention when that plays through. With the counterpoint of lower winds and lower strings in very simple octaves, then this unison here of all the strings, except for the double basses, doubled by two bassoons, and then echoed on those last three pitches by the simulation of a piano. See what you think, whether or not that really does sound piano-like. I think that that was what Ravel was going for, just to sort of amaze his audience. They might have thought, well, where's that piano coming from, if this was done right by Kusevitsky? Let's have a listen to that, and then we'll get into the first proper movement of this lecture.
And now for the actual main movement of this lecture, Tuileries, which are these big public gardens in Paris. But it's not really the painting that he wants to comment musically on. It was the very charming depictions of children who were playing in the park, which Hartman may have used just for perspective, so that the viewer of the painting could see some perspective. Apparently, these kids were sort of fighting as they played in the park, so that is what this is all about. Very childish fighting. And we once again have a very long tempo marking, Allegretto non troppo, which is sort of unnecessary, right? Allegretto is already a non troppo sort of marking, but yeah, whatever. So Allegretto, but not taken too far. Capriccioso, so in a capricious way. If you don't know what capricious means, it means playful in a way that you can't really trust, right? So a caprice, for instance, in music is a piece that's supposed to surprise the listener so that the listener's expectations are betrayed or toyed with. And you could almost think of this as a caprice in itself, right? It would certainly have toyed with the listener's expectations back then, basically just from the fact that it is in a Lydian mode making the listener perhaps feel that the opening chord of B major, we're still stuck in B major, was not actually the tonic. And yet, right at the end, we end in B major, E sharp and all. That's our raised fourth, right? Then another common feature of a caprice is that it tends to be nimble, right? So we've got some very nimble playing. You might recall that in the introduction, I was talking about how Mussorgsky's reputation for being rather big and thick and clumsy in his writing is a bit betrayed, that whole notion, because there are many passages that are very fleet, very light-fingered, and this definitely is one of those movements. You have to be the soul of delicacy to pull this off. To a degree, you have to compromise as a pianist when you are playing these very, very fast staccatos because if you make them too pointy, then the phrase doesn't flow. So you can have this wonderfully light playing, very, very rapid and graceful. There are some passages of Schubert that are a lot like this. Anyhow, let's break this down and just think as orchestrators, right? We've got this sort of taunting opening, almost like the kids are going, you know, neener neener at each other to try to get a reaction. And there's this little melody that takes us right back to where we started. Then after a repeat, things start to escalate, climbing in pitch. And before there can be a complete repeat of this reaction bar, after these chords, Mussorgsky hikes it up even a little bit farther and then repeats that bar. If you remember, I had talked about Mussorgsky composing using cells, right? Using different bars and contrasting them in different keys or repeating them in ways that provided contrasts with where he started or with where he was developing from. Then we have one more little very, very fleet-fingered reaction, which pulls us right back to where we started. As we're looking at this, once again, always think about what instrument might take what particular line or group of notes. Back where we started, we repeat this again. Then we have yet another reaction. Finally, we get to the second subject. Quite charming here, this D-sharp minor episode. And you'll notice that the piano scoring stays quite statically in one place, for the most part. Little mid-range intervals, harmonizing a middle of the staff kind of melody. And it stays that way pretty much until you get to here when the music sort of explodes outwards a little bit and becomes much more engaging, much more charming. Perhaps these are the kids just running around and being silly in Mussorgsky's musical imagination. And we seem to be pulling back to this material as we go, right? You can see some of the same elements coming back, and then we are somehow approaching backwards to our original idea. 
using different fragments and elements of things that have come before. Then finally, we're back to the original taunting opening. And then things just sort of flit away and end up in a beautiful little B major chord. So we could have analyzed this for its harmony, which is also charming. And for perhaps the developing craft that we see in Mussorgsky, I mean, really, Mussorgsky was a genius with very haphazard training. So some of Tchaikovsky's critique is valid, and yet Mussorgsky's imagination is so fertile and his harmony is so intriguing that maybe it was better off that Mussorgsky had the approach that he did so that we were able to get these beautiful gems from him that run throughout this entire piece. I feel that this is a superb piece of music and it's something that would invite me to orchestrate it as well, had Ravel not gotten there first. I would say that despite the fact that, to a degree, <laughs> I wouldn't mind orchestrating practically everything if I had the time, but I don't really have that urge with this because Ravel has done it so beautifully and other orchestrators as well, though I did orchestrate the Dance of the Chicks in their shells for a crossover concert once, just because it was either that or rent out the score from Boosie and Hawks for $800 just to have this one little fragment of music. So I orchestrated it in my style, which is similar to Ravel's, but used the orchestra in a way that would be a lot clearer. The orchestra that we had for that particular series of concerts so let's have a listen to that piano score now and really listen to the colors that are being explored, the way that certain phrases are being played, and think to yourself about how you would orchestrate this, what particular orchestral colors are implied. And we will take a look at how Ravel brought that to life for orchestra. And now for Ravel's orchestration. I actually feel that this is easier to read than the piano score for some reason. I don't know, when everything is exploded out, I just tend to recognize it better and feel it more. And that's actually kind of a strange thing to say because I am a pianist. So I can look at the original score and basically hear in my head what the music should sound like. But for some reason, when everything is kind of broken into its different constituent components and spread out across a page of score like this, I seem to absorb it even better. I don't know why. I think it's just because I orchestrate constantly. So it's really no big deal for me. Um, I've just gotten used to looking at things that way. The first thing that I notice when I look at this is the role of the A clarinets here in just playing the same interval all the way through. This is actually a D sharp and a B, right? So it's inside the other harmonies that we are seeing here. But it still works great. The oboe playing the melody from above and the bassoons playing the harmony from below, it works fine. And notice that the bassoons don't change what they're doing either. So really, we just look at what's going on with the oboe, 
and how it plays this beautiful little line. And notice that the first flute comes in and plays it with a more delicate articulation. Slurred staccato. And it gives it a slightly breathy, pointy kind of a feeling when these two are combined together. Then same thing again, and same thing here, except that the first flute plays it an octave higher, but ends up on this little G sharp rather than an octave above. Notice that here, the second oboe is coming in and first clarinet is just supplying this middle voice in here. And bassoons are scored pretty much exactly like the left hand of the piano part. But once again, oboe and flute join in unison the same way that they did before. The new added element here is this rolled pizzicato in the violas, which is taken up by the second violins as we get to the end of the page. Pretty much just adding on to this harmonically. When you remember how these staves work, right? This is an E sharp and that's a B. So you see these same two notes there with a G sharp above. So it's just stretching that harmony across more pizzicatoed strings. Now here we really start to add more elements. With cello pizzicato, notice that there are no double basses in this movement. Harps, which also add that same quality and they will tend to arpeggiate slightly anyways, just as a natural feature of how harpists play. Clarinets and oboes doubling each other. However, here we've got a two clarinets taking up the melody and flutes doubling with that same sort of kind of slightly tiptoeing articulation, but the oboes taking on a harmonic duty in the middle of that particular little run. That repeats, and then all of these upper winds rush downwards. Then second clarinet running up to answer them over a two flutes and first clarinet. We skipped a little bit of important stuff in here, and that is the combination of bassoons and horns here. And this is some very simple Rimsky-Korsakov writing and that is to get a more delicate horn-like middle range harmony from bassoons plus horns rather than four horns. So you get the beautiful bassy quality of the bassoons, that warm quality, plus the very direct warmth of the horns, and combined together it really does sound like a very delicate four-part harmony on horns. Continuing on, we come back to the original first bar, same thing, answering with oboe and flutes, and then there's this little cry from above and a run up by the first clarinet. And that is really the first episode. The Wikipedia page for this movement says that this is ABA construction, but really it's A and then B and then sort of backwards A, right? Uh, as we saw in the piano score, the different elements of the first episode are brought back at the end of the second episode and gradually work their way back to the beginning in reverse order to a degree. But we'll explore that when we get to it. So listen for all of those things. It's once again very simple, very elegant, and yet ingenious scoring. I like the fact that Ravel experiments with blending different colors together rather than just making the functions discrete to one or the other group of winds. For instance, here he could have just had clarinets only, right? Instead, he blends the clarinets and the oboes together fearlessly, and it works perfectly fine. Then, of course, there's the Rimsky-Korsakov approach to making a horn-like harmony, adding bassoons to horns and all of this gentle plucking from below, then the very simple way that everything begins with oboe and flute teaming up and having these reeds sort of taunt each other in the middle. 
So listen for all of those simple but very beautifully scored elements, and then we'll take a look at the second episode. So let's take it from here to the end of the piece, since this is really a very, very short middle section. It's only about eight bars long, and then the following part isn't all that long either, so we might as well just make this the end of the lecture. The strings come in sur la touche, so sul tasto, played over the fingerboard, and I feel that this is a wonderful contrast to the more mixed palette of winds and strings that we saw before, just to really give the strings their own particular expressive moment. And actually, the more expressively you do this, the more impact that it has on the listener, I feel. And as you may hear in recorded versions of this, there is a tendency to really push this, especially when the strings get to this little portamento slide up. But it's still very, very simple scoring. Second violins taking the harmony below, first violins playing the melody above. With this little reaction here, flutes playing a little rip of staccatos, doubled by clarinets playing the same thing legato, and harp doing a little cascade downward over the same notes. That is a wonderful effect as well. And once again, there's a similarity here to the sound of a piano, and I think that that might be another one of Ravel's little tricks. Coming back here, things develop with the violas coming in to play the voice from below and then joining in with the little snatch of bass line here as the music develops. Then we get a reiteration of this little opening theme here, done exactly the same way, except with flute from above. So once again we've got our little trick of flute disappearing a little bit into the violins. Now here this could be a place where the flute might play out a little bit more if the conductor kind of gives them the little hey let's hear a little bit more from you kind of hand signal. In which case you would sort of lose that little magic trick of the flute disappearing into the first violin. But you'll just have to listen for that yourself when we get to this particular point and we hear the playback from the Thailand Philharmonic Orchestra. I took a look at their view page for this particular recording that I'm using and I noticed that a couple of our Orchestration Online community members had commented and let the conductor, Alfonso Scarano, know that I had sent them over to have a look. And I think that that would be a nice tradition to continue. Really, just let him know that you are a member of the Orchestration Online community or that you found out about their recording because of these lectures or some other kind of thing. And that will help to show them just how involved we are, just how dedicated we are as listeners, that we really listen for all of those different things and that we're trying to improve ourselves as orchestrators. And I think that that is something that both the conductor and the orchestra will really appreciate. They love having listeners who are really paying attention to all the details and who are understanding the effort that's going into a really fine performance, like the one that they recorded. All right, continuing on, we see our episode trending back towards the A section with this lovely little clarinet solo here. And I feel that this is just the most beautiful moment. It is that placid, lovely sound that you get from a soft, clarinet in its clarino register, playing in a very calm way, even though it may be rapid notes. There's a sense of placidity, I feel. And then the emotion starts to get a little bit more involved with the 
increase in dynamics. Of course, accompanied from below with a very, very standard layout of strings. Not played Sultasto anymore, right? Now we're starting to revisit elements of the opening section. Very simply, we have those rolled pizzicatos in the seconds and violas starting to come back in. We've got this sort of dashing playing back and forth. And then we are really starting to get portions that we've seen before, the horns and the bassoons working together as if they were four horns, as we saw before and oboes and clarinets, flute running down from above along with the violins, and a little bit of harp in there. So it's similar to what happened before, but a little bit fiercer, right? And then that sets this up for Piano Subito, which I feel is just a lovely contrast, just immediately pulling back to where things were. And that is also reminiscent of a child playing, isn't it? Children can just go from 90 miles an hour to zero in a second. They have that wonderful malleable quality where they're just constantly testing and exploring and excited and then calm. And that is something that you can just hear if you are near a playground or if you are near a school where you can hear the rather clamorous sounds of recess happening, which is the case with my particular house is that I'm about a half a kilometer away, a full kilometer if you walk there, but a half a kilometer away from a school and it is on the other side of a very shallow valley from me. So I can definitely hear the sounds of those children playing, one of whom is my own son. And you're right around 11.15 every morning, <laughs> the sounds just suddenly burst forth and it does remind me of moments like this, where you'll just hear tons and tons of clamor and then suddenly there'll be nothing. And then gradually it'll build up again and you never know why. It's just as a lot of people suddenly deciding to be quiet at the same time for different reasons and who knows why. But I feel that a lot of that is being brought forth in both the piano version and then amplified even more expressively by Ravel. So we are slowly approaching our original bar here was the development of it, very simply doubled by winds and strings here. Then this sudden explosion of energy here. Very, very cool how the first bassoon doubles cellos dovetailing into violas here, ending with this little pizzicato. That's very cool. And then the melody from above is pretty standard flutes plus clarinets plus first and second violins but it does make a really beautiful scorching sound altogether. Now we're finally back to our original bar, scored exactly as before with a little ting from Triangle, if you're paying attention. Same doubling of very nimble first flute and generous, graceful first oboe. Then there's this sudden rise up between the clarinets this is something that probably could be played just by first clarinet all the way through, giving this top note to the second clarinetist. But it's kind of neat for both clarinetists to get a bite at this little phrase here. And just a touch of harmony from the bassoons. This is neat. Pizzicato jumping down to this final pluck from the strings plus some harp. So. The soul of delicacy, really. Even when things get kind of strong, get kind of ferocious, it's still very delicately orchestrated. And that is a Ravel signature. Since this is so short, I won't laboriously go through everything I want to remind you to listen for. But listen for that delicacy, I would say. Especially here towards the end. But certainly also with the way that this second subject is dealt with as well. And listen for this beautiful, very placid clarinet playing and the lovely contrast here of the strings somewhat solely, I feel, here. Then I'll see you in a week or two for our next movement, which has no promenade introduction, so we can just go straight into it. Thanks so much for watching, and once again I want to thank 
the Thailand Philharmonic Orchestra for their contribution to this series, along with the conductor Alfonso Scarano, who was so generous towards me in his appreciation of what I'm doing and in his support for our community. I'm so grateful for that, and any appreciation that this community can show them I think would be really treasured by them.